There was a time when folks in Appalachia sat on the porch each evening. They gathered round one of the elders of the family and listened to them tell stories about growing up in these mountains. Yet, I don't think these elders considered themselves storytellers. No, sir. You see, Appalachians passed down their traditions and their superstitions and faith the same way the old-time mountaineers did, through the oral tradition. Heck, 50 years ago, that's the way mountain folks engaged in the art of conversation. A few of these authentic storytellers achieved fame and legendary status before they passed on. Folks like Ray Hicks. However, the truth is, most of these storytellers passed on without anyone outside of these mountains ever hearing their stories. I recently ran upon a story by a man named Charlie Baker. Now, Charlie was a master storyteller, even before the word existed. He lived in the Autumn Well community near Pressman's home. Now, that area of Hawkins County was settled over 200 years ago, and is a special place rich with history and tradition. This story I'm about to tell is in Charlie's own words, and it was taped back in 1971 as Charlie's friends and neighbors gathered around one autumn evening on his front porch in Sulphur Springs Valley. The first time I saw him was back in 1925. I was 12 years old, and Pap had sent me up on the ridge, past the new ground, out yonder to fetch the mules. It was dark, but the harvest moon had just risen over Stone Mountain, so it lit up my path up the ridge. But the way was steep, steep as a cow's face anyhow. I topped the hill and I heard something moving in the bushes up ahead. I thought it was one of the mules stirring around up there, so I didn't think too much about it. All of a sudden, I heard footsteps. Coming around the hill on one of the old cow paths. Now, you see... Nobody was supposed to be up there on the ridge messing around that time of night. So, I jumped in the bush and I hid from whoever was coming. I sure didn't want to meet a mule thief up there all by myself. The steps were getting closer and closer, and I was laying on the leaves with my belly hugging the ground for dear life. I was flatter than a run-over hat. There in the moonlight, a tall man dressed in dark and tattered clothes came into view. He had dirt and leaves all over him like he had come up out of the ground. And as he came close to me, I looked up at him and I was trying to see his face. But he didn't have one. Hell, he didn't even have a head. Just a bloody stump. My hair stood up on my head and I was plump scared to death. He was standing there about a foot away from me when suddenly he turned around and headed down the hill towards the old Smith graveyard. I swear he walked into that big oak tree down there and just disappeared. I took off right down that hill and I ran through a briar patch. I didn't sleep a wink for a dad blang week. A whole year went by when I finally got over seeing that headless man. Well, sir, I was up in a barn one night milking, and I heard them footsteps approaching the barn. I looked out there, and I saw him coming through the field. When he got almost to the barn, he turned suddenly, and he crossed the creek and disappeared near an old Indian salt lick. I told my family about seeing the headless man, and they all looked at me like I was crazy. 
Then one night in early October, while we were all sitting on the porch like we are now, I heard him coming down the hill behind the house. He walked down the side yonder, and he walked past us on the front porch. Pap turned white as a sheet, and Aunt Belle Ash exclaimed, Lord have mercy, that dead burn devil don't have a head. We watched him walk through the yard and on up the road towards the Davis's farm and disappear into the night. Now, other people in the community commenced to seeing this headless man. Smokey Lawson was walking home from Guy Hurd's store one night and he'd walked beside him all the way home. Kate Helton lived up in Helton Hollow near Spryer's Chapel Church. One morning before daylight, she saw the headless man walk out of the woods and down the road. Then, we didn't see him for a long time until one night in 1965. I was coming home from Fred Mallory's and he fell in right beside me walking. Just as we neared Sulphur Springs Valley, the headless man turned and walked up the hill and disappeared into the shepherd graveyard. That was the last time I ever saw him. Papa always told me if you ask a spook, what in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are you doing here? It has to tell you. But I never did ask it anything. I figured, how was it going to tell me? He didn't even have a head. But I always wondered where he came from and who he was in his other life. Now, Charlie told stories of the headless man up until the day he died. He and others who saw the headless specter always claimed it was true. And this story has ties to historical facts. The old salt lick mentioned in Charlie's story was an ancient Indian hunting ground. Charlie's house was located on the old Smith's homestead. And you see, in 1863, during the throes of the Civil War, Henry Smith was kidnapped by bushwhackers in front of his family, and he was never seen again. His wife is buried up in the Smith Cemetery. In the late 1800s, Henry's son, George, found a human skeleton while digging out a spring branch. But the head was never located. Brooks Chapel was made as a makeshift hospital during the Civil War for Confederate soldiers. Now, the building was torn down in the early part of the 20th century and the material was used to build Charlie's house. Even today, a visit to Sulphur Springs Valley is beautiful this time of the year, but if you come at night, be on the lookout for the tall, headless stranger. He may still walk these dark and lonely hills. <laughs> <laughs>